Welcome uh, to another of our different talks, a very special talk today. I want to acknowledge the presence of our chair, uh, Robert Johansson, uh, and thank you all for coming for this very special talk by Senator Lisa Singh, who I count as a great friend of the Institute, a great personal friend as well. And uh, uh, Lisa Singh has been, as you know, a great champion of Australia in their relations. She was elected as uh, a senator from Tasmania in August 2010 and began her term in July 2001. Following in the footsteps of her grandfather, Ram Jati Singh, who was a member of the Fijian parliament in the 1960s. She is considered the first woman of South Asian descent to be elected to the Australian parliament. In October 2013, Bill Shorten, the leader of the opposition, appointed Senator Singh as shadow parliamentary secretary to the shadow attorney general. She was promoted to shadow parliamentary secretary for the environment, climate change, and water in June 2014. Senator Singh is a passionate supporter, as I said, of the Australia-India relationship and is developing and strengthening ties between both countries through her role as an Australian senator. In the previous Labour government, uh, Senator Singh took the role of caucus liaison to facilitate federal parliamentary Labour Party's engagement on Australia in the Asian Century White Paper. Uh, <coughs> Senator Singh has been recognised uh, for her role in cementing Australia-India relations by the President of India uh, by awarding her during the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman Divas, with the Pravasi Saman, Bharatiya Saman Award. In 2008, while serving as a member of the Tasmanian House of Assembly, the Tasmanian Premier appointed a Minister for Correction and Consumer Protection and Minister for Workplace Relations. Before and after her term in the Tasmanian Parliament as a Labour member for Denison, Senator Singh served the community through her work in the union movement, the non-government sector and the public ser service. She was Hobart City Council's Hobart Citizen of the Year in 2004 and in 2010 founded the Asbestos Free Tasmanian Foundation, a support organization for those suffering from asbestos disease in Tasmania. She graduated from, from the University of Tasmania with a Bachelor of Arts Honours and holds a Master's of Degrees, Master of International Relations degree from Macquarie University. Today, she is speaking to us on contemporary multiculturalism from Australia to India and back. Senator Singh, it's a great honour for us to have you here today. Thank you very much, Amitabh, and thank you everyone for being here uh, for this tip and talk, especially to uh, Chair Mr Johansson uh, and all uh, distinguished guests as you all are being here today. Um, I would really like to thank, though, Amitabh, the Australian Indian Institute as a whole for the invitation to come and speak. Often it's difficult to find the time that, that fits for uh, when I'm not in Canberra and, and in Melbourne, but we've managed to do that and I'm really pleased. At the beginning, I want to um, compare some kind of elementary facts about uh, India and Australia, things that we probably all know, but, but when put into context, uh, I think really share uh, a light on what we talk about when we talk about the differences and similarities between our two countries. Of course, India has a population of some 1.24 billion people, the world's large, second largest country, compared to Australia's 23 million. On the other hand, at 7.7 .7 million square kilometres, Australia's landmass is more than double that of India's 3.3 million square kilometres. Nearly half of India's population are under 25, compared to only 31% of ours. And where our population is ageing, India's is marked by its youth as well as it's by its diversity in culture, religion, ethnicity and language. 22 languages have been given official regional language status in India. Some of the major ones, apart from Hindi and Bengali, are Telugu, Marathi, Tamil, Urdu, Gujarati and it goes on and on making India one of the most diverse countries in the world. But of course, Australia too, we like to think that we have diversity as well. And at, with our makeup and range of languages other than English being things such as Mandarin, Italian, Arabic, Greek, Cantonese and Vietnamese. 
But immigration from China and India were the third and fourth largest sources of migrants, according to the census in 2011, and continue to grow rapidly. So I think that both Indian and Australian societies are very much multicultural societies and often consider the ways in which they are connected and how their similarities and differences depend our understanding of, of both. So I think uh, of both Indian and Australian societies as multicultural and I want to look today at exactly, uh, rather than simply thinking uh, of India as a contributor to Australian multiculturalism, in this talk, I want to think of India as a multicultural nation in itself, just like Australia. Um, and in doing so, I wanted to uh, share with you, uh, firstly, uh, when Indira Gandhi, the then pr Prime Minister of India, visited uh, Canberra uh, back in 1968, uh, she said, in relation to the similarities and differences between our two countries, if I, if I wonder if any two countries could be as different as Australia and India. More than the distance in miles of ocean, what separates them is their history and culture and the entirely different problems they have had to face. But now modern technology has telescoped distances and made us next door neighbours. We can say that we are both vibrant democracies. Well, obviously 1968 was some time ago. Uh, I think that the connection is a lot, lot stronger today than the differences more that uh, uh, the then Prime Minister Gandhi was, was pointing out. But nevertheless, I think it's a good um, landmark to start on because we know that this year we will also have the visit uh, by uh, Australia's new Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, to Australia in November for the G20. So we will see what uh, he uh, c uh, contributes in relation to the similarities and or differences of Australia and India at that time. But using some of my own um, experiences from recent travels to India and my connections with the Indian diaspora <coughs> here in Australia, I want to trace out the implications of conceptualising India as a multicultural nation. What does multiculturalism mean in a land of 1.25 billion people, more than 2,000 ethnic groups, all the major religions, and a myriad of gods to worship? Talking about these issues, moving from Australian multiculturalism to Indian multiculturalism and back, it's important to locate my own speaking position to you here today as an Australian of Indian heritage, one of more than, I think, 400 or 450,000 uh, people in Australia with Indian origins. So for me, I am the, the, the daughter of uh, uh, an Indian uh, father who came here to Australia, uh, like so many, as an international student in the 1960s. And uh, I guess what I can say after that is the rest is history. Uh, but obviously he met my, my mother of uh, Anglo origin and uh, has settled here in Australia ever since. But growing up, of course, I grew up, therefore, with, with two cultures, in a sense. Uh, uh, it was the Indian culture, though, that I guess was the most vibrant and uh, something that has stayed with me and continued to grow as I've become someone uh, of a public face, of someone who is now uh, in the political sphere uh, recognising uh, my heritage as one of, well, as the only, I understand, um, uh, federal member of parliament of, of Indian origin. Hopefully that will change. But what are the practical implications uh, of, my, of my own heritage here in Australia? Obviously for me they were growing up and being part of you know, festivals that we all know and love and, and share. Things like Diwali was celebrated at home, we put candles out in front of the house. Uh, we would have pujas at different people's houses because there was no temple. Uh, in, in Hobart, in our town. It was a small Indian community. But since that time, it's grown. It's grown so much that I don't even recognise or realise it. And I'll, t I'll tell you why, why that is. Um, it could be something like, last week I came to Melbourne, I drove from the, uh, uh, I didn't drive, I got a taxi from the airport in, into the city. It, of course, it was an Indian taxi driver. But the conversation I had 
uh, with that Indian taxi driver, which was, his name was Ravind, and he was from the Punjab state, he was from Amritsar. So he was a Sikh. We talked about Sikhism. Then we talked about the Navratri festival that was going on at that time. Uh, the day before, it was Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about his daughter and how he's teaching her Hindi, uh, what kind of education she was having here in Australia. We talked about the upcoming Diwali festival and what he would be doing for Diwali, what I would be doing for Diwali. This was a common conversation that I have with so many people of Indian origin in Australia and other people of non-Indian origin. That is how so much of uh, India's diaspora has given Australia. So much so for me as someone of Indian heritage, I grow up seeing that as just part of who I am. And that's really to me what uh, the practical implications of my own heritage mean living here in Australia as someone of Indian origin. Um, it also means, though, being able to access another, another world, to enter into and participate in meaningful discussions on politics, social and cultural forces at play in the sphere of uh, my father's family and heritage. For others, it's a matter of finding ways of integrating into Australia, but staying connected with culture ensuring children do learn Hindi, for instance, or speak uh, in the language of their forebears. While a monoculture might have to confine its conversations to a limited reading uh, of Anglo-Australian invasion and settlement, which in itself excludes the fundamentally important story of the indigenous world displaced and colonised in this process, a multicultural approach opens up contemporary Australia as the site of global conversations through cultural networks that stretch from one end of the world to the other. Much more exciting, I think. Multiculturalism is very much an important strand of thinking within broader progressive liberal political discourse in Australia. In his time as uh, the immigration uh, minister, Chris Bowen attempted to articulate what a social liberalist version of multiculturalism might look like. Rather than being centred on communities, he argued that the benefits of multiculturalism must be centred on individuals and, more importantly, their ability to contribute economically to Australia. He said, and I quote, multiculturalism is about inviting every individual member of society to be everything they can be and supporting each new arrival in overcoming whatever obstacles they face as they adjust to new country and society and allowing them to flourish as individuals. It is a matter of liberalism. A truly robust liberal society is a multicultural society. So in this vision, we only need multiculturalism, it would seem, as a way of keeping a diverse society and all its economic and cultural benefits together working in harmony. Multiculturalism, multiculturalism in this sense becomes a means to an end. As, as Bowen said, if Australia is to be free and equal, then it will be multicultural. But if it is to be multicultural, it must remain free and equal. But on the other hand, I want to point to a version of multiculturalism more based on a communitarian understanding of the world, uh, where it sees support for diversity not so much as a means of achieving other ends, so much as an end in itself. Multiculturalism empowers diverse ethnic communities to live out their own identities and values and to be supported in doing so because it should be an important societal aim for people of different backgrounds to celebrate themselves and their cultures. So community life, customs and cultural norms are important in themselves, not just as servants of broader economic or liberal aims. So having examined Australian multiculturalism, it is now time for me to turn to the Indian situation. And in this section, I draw on some of the many discussions and meetings and experiences I've had in my recent trip with the Deputy Opposition Leader and Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Tanya Plibersek, a few weeks ago, as well as visits I've made to India over the last decade. The Australian Labor Party, which I belong, has a proud uh, history of engagement with India and with the care for an expansion of 
the relationship between the two nations. One example many of you will be familiar with was the most recent, uh, most recently was the historical significant visit of the then Prime Minister Julia Gillard in 2012 to India. At their meeting, Prime Ministers Gillard and Singh agreed to hold annual meetings between the two countries, working on a strategic partnership first envisaged under, the Prime, under Prime Minister Rudd. A number of initiatives were agreed to help build the already strong economic relationship between the two countries, with two-ray trade of some 20 billion at the time, and Indian investment in Australia reaching 11 billion. But there have been many successes in building of business relationships with <coughs> India and the range of economic agreements and cooperation between the two countries is growing and in good health. But today I'm talking about multiculturalism, about social, cultural and political similarities and links between the two countries and the importance of soft power. It is through this sort of soft diplomacy generating those people-to-people -people connections that a stronger basis for relationships between the two countries, I believe, can really be achieved. Indian and Australian relationships, I think, are a work in progress. But with India as Australia's second largest source of international students and our largest source of skilled migration, the links between our peoples are multiplying and strengthening. It is also worth considering the foundations of what Nehru termed unity and diversity, how the founders of modern India and subsequent governments have sought to guarantee social cohesion and protect the rights of the diverse groups who make up an Indian society. Uh, Ratna Ghosh's uh, uh, paper, I think I saw earlier, a uh, copy here, but uh, for, done for the Australia India Institute, explores the Indian constitution as a founding document of multiculturalism safeguarding the rights and identities of minority groups, but also reserving privileges for disadvantaged groups to advance their interests and standing in society. In all my time in visiting India, it has continued to grow and it has continued to grow across all of those groups. Of course, my first time, like many young people, uh, was backpacking and holidaying through, through India, meeting a diverse number of groups without even realising. Uh, secondly, I, I went with my son to visit our sponsor child under World Vision uh, in Tamil Nadu. Since that time, I've been an as elected member of parliament, uh, state and federal, visited to meet with key stakeholders. So whether it's been uh, with unions, looking at workplace safety and the issue of asbestos, or whether it's been through the Australian Indian Institute and the Lowy Institute, in the Australia-India uh, roundtables. All of those times have been very enriching, but very <coughs> diverse in themselves. One of my also recent times was actually in Himachal Pradesh, visiting uh, the exiled Tibetan parliament and the, Buddha, the Tibetan Buddhist people there. So all of those experiences uh, have, have given me an insight that is diverse in itself on many different levels. But my recent visit uh, to, to India with uh, Tanya Plibersek, we had many discussions with political leaders in New Delhi who were concerned with the, the new government of, of Narendra <coughs> Modi and the profound political changes that went with the transformation of Indian politics from one centred in that continuing dominance of the Congress party to the new regime of the BJP. It is hard to overstate the depths of the Congress's loss with the party, reduced from 244 to 54 seats. But what was striking when talking to some of the Congress leaders that we met, such as Dr Shashi Tharoor and Rahul Gandhi, was the importance that they had attached to ideas of diversity and pluralism. However, in order to understand the way that diversity functions in India and its interaction with the political system, it is necessary to look at the twin systems of caste and socio-economic status, two issues that, I, that we talked in detail uh, with those two Congress leaders. While many years of government programs has sought to eradicate the caste system or to assist those in lower caste to gain educational and economic opportunities, in India in order to escape poverty, 
I've learnt that, unfortunately, caste still does exist and their divisions play a strong role in determining people's identities and life chances. However, whereas previously a person's caste could entirely predict their economic destiny, now with greater social mobility and the ability to access government benefits to compensate uh, for their caste position, there is the possibility and sometimes the reality of them being able to be in a better position than someone from higher caste even in terms of skills or jobs or income. So to understand uh, the diversity in India, I think we need to be able to overlay these two different matrix matrices, one of caste and one of socioeconomic status. While these may intersect and reinforce each other in some areas, in others they will bring conflict and generate new social formations in groups with loyalties and values that are hard to predict. Political parties, therefore, must be able to speak across caste and class and appeal to the population on multiple levels. There are thousands of layers in the stratification of these caste class complexes and political alliances must cross these boundaries and make these connections. Those who have the biggest infrastructures and the best strategies for achieving building these alliances, I think, will win elections. And I think this definitely also goes for Australia as it does for India. At the last national election though, between very much the BJP and Congress, although there are many other parties as we know in India, it was clear that the former had developed the capacity to do this at a much greater extent than the latter. Uh, Prime Minister, now Prime Minister Modi was able to draw support from and bind with chains of loyalty groups of Indians on the lowest wages and from the most subjugated castes as well as gaining donations from and the backing of the wealthiest sections of Indian society. Modi's ability to cross these caste and class divides and generate alliances where they had not existed before is a dis defining feature and the well-known and often cited story of Narendra Modi's own origins uh, uh, as he is, it is no accident. It forms part of a broader strategy in which the Prime Minister's own identity becomes the centre of a narrative of social and economic mobility, linked in then to the BJP and drawing on a variety of groups into its networks who might otherwise be excluded from relationships with a party that is identified with middle and upper class concerns. And while it may seem that the overlaying of the matrices of socio-economic mobility and the ancient system of caste is a sign of the erosion of the old hierarchical regime by the demands of fast-moving contemporary capitalism, it is also worth pausing to stop and think before making those generalisations. Caste still does play a role in defining the identities of people in many parts of India, although some people might be able to overcome those areas of disadvantage and attain a position beyond what they could have expected in the past. There will continue to be, however, uh, many who are not able to cross those barriers, and that is something worth taking heed of. How then does this model of complex diversity and the stratific stratification of society, not only on socio-economic lines, but through a system of hierarchy, identity, illuminate Australian multiculturalism and make us reflect on the structures and functions of our own society. Certainly in Australia, we do not have anything as rigid, perhaps, or as Byzantine as uh, the Indian caste system. But while there may be well be the limits to social mobility of different ethnic groups in Australia, and patterns of discrimination based on race and religion, these are mapped directly onto the socio-economic contours of contemporary Australia rather than onto a different parallel hierarchy. We see this in the design of our legal infrastructure of equality, our anti-discrimination laws and our industrial relations system, the aims of which are to ensure equal access to jobs, equal access to services, the basics of socio-economic life. In preventing restrictions on accesses to these and heading off discrimination in favour of some groups over others, it is envisaged that Australian society will be opened up to mobility 
in all sections of the community. Are there any long-term barriers to this sort of social movement foreseen in the design of our laws in Australia? Of course there are. And I think most recently, uh, our Race Discrimination Commissioner, Tim Sapomasane, identified some of those barriers in what he described as the bamboo curtain, the systemic exclusion of Asian Australians from top positions in various institutions and centres of social and economic power, and their quarantining in a limited range of jobs and roles. And while this is not a rigid system like that of the caste system, the evidence supporting the existence of something like the bamboo curtain in Australia is quite strong. Sao Pomasame pre pre presents a range of examples from key political and economic sectors to illustrate his point. For instance, he notes that in 2014, only 1.7% of those who sit in our federal parliament uh, are, are of our country come from uh, an Asian background, and that is it is four, there are four parliamentarians from the whole of Australia in the Commonwealth Legislature who have Asian heritage. Uh, the, their names are, of course, Penny Wong, D.O. Wang, Ian Goodenow and myself. Further, of those four, as I said, I'm the only one of, of Indian heritage. This is in stark contrast, of course, to India's parliament, which is much more multicultural. Australia's parliament is still very much predominantly uh, Anglo in its makeup, and I think we have some work to do and way to go uh, to ensure that our multicultural society in Australia is reflected in all levels of our society, but very much so in our democracy, and that being in the Commonwealth Parliament of Australia. So Australia has some way to go in turning its rhetoric, you could say, of its engagement with Asia and its embrace of the diversity and cultural richness of Asian Australians into a society free from discrimination and open to all. So just to conclude, and as uh, one of your visiting fellows, Ratna Ghosh, highlighted on this topic, in the West, multiculturalism emerged as an important concept in the 70s in countries such as Australia and Canada, as part of that process of dealing with the major social challenges at that post-war migration brought to these societies. Along with policies based on multiculturalism went legislative regimes, including anti-discrimination laws that protect the rights of the newly recognised minorities and ethnic groups. But discussions about multiculturalism in India, on the other hand, only really emerged in the 1990s and were mainly in response to the growing international acceptance of the term and the question about what it might mean in such a diverse country already. It would be a mistake, though, to think that just because it had not adopted multiculturalist policies in name, that they did not exist. In fact, as we saw from uh, my earlier observation uh, about the Indian constitution, the Republic of India has had multiculturalist policies protecting the culture and autonomy of its ethnic, linguistic and religious minorities from its origin. They are guaranteed legally by the constitution and politically by the representation of particular ethno-linguistic groups by particular state governments. While Australian legislators had to engage in a flurry of lawmaking to implement protections for the rights of minorities in the 1970s and 80s here, in India these guarantees were in the founding document of the nation, structured in their constitution. I think that is something in the current debate of Australia looking at um, having a, a, a referendum on its constitution to recognise uh, Indigenous Australians, we could actually learn a bit from India's constitution being much, uh, much younger than ours. Also on reflecting on the debates between different types of multiculturalism in Australia, with those that prioritise the individual's rights compared to those where it is the ethnic community as a whole that is considered the central subject. We can see that in India it is the communitarian approach, that community approach, that has clearly been the dominant uh, tendency. The constitution deals with and gives rights to ethnic, linguistic and marginalised social groups as a whole, recognising the communal identities, interests and culture of its people. 
For a nation as large and as complex as India, managing the relationships between these different communities is a central political function and it needs to be done at the level of the groups as a whole, not just as their members uh, of in, as in individuals. But I think, again, Australia could also learn from that approach as well. There are many ways, in fact, that we can learn and share on our different approaches to multiculturalism. Our experiences uh, here both in, with both countries con contribute and assist each other. The standards of governance that we have here in Australia, I think, is something that we could share uh, to some degree. Uh, and sharing our capacities in this area, I think, will only benefit a new government in India. On the other side, the extraordinary richness of Indian society and culture in all its diversity is deep. Its deep historical practices of tolerance, the sharing of different cultures, and its sophisticated and ancient spiritual traditions are things which we in Australia can look to enrich our lives. As I said, it is a work in progress, but I hope that it continues to grow and flourish uh, the Australia-Indian multicultural relationship into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, great talk with insights from both Australia and India. Now it's open for questions or comments. And please introduce yourself, Natasha. Um. Hi, I'm Nizam Natasha, uh, and I represent the Press Trust of India. Uh, my question is, as a you know, what challenges did you face as a in, during your political career um, as a person of Indian origin? Thank you, Natasha. Um, look, the challenges that I've faced have been not just someone of of uh, of an ethnic background of Indian origin, but also as a as a woman uh, of ethnic background and Indian origin, and that. That goes from the, the party political level, uh, but also the parliamentary level. You know, it hasn't still been that long ago that it was uh, the last bastion, at least, an all-male domain. But what, I guess, naturally happens when you are perhaps seeing, seeing yourself all of a sudden as a minority, whether it's based on gender or ethnicity, in a new place, in a new workplace or, or thereabouts, is you identify other people like you. So one person who has become a great mentor and friend for me in my time in the federal parliament is Penny Wong. And I've, I've watched her and recognised the strengths and the way she has conducted herself in dealing with some of the challenges of being very much a minority. <coughs> Having said that though, like her, I think I'd be right to speak for her as well, we don't let our gender and our ethnicity define us every day. So as you're going about doing your work, that, that's where the equality issue comes in. You do, want to be, you, you do want your argument to be valued and treated as equally as uh, you know, a white Anglo-Saxon man next to you. That's, having said that, there's, you know, it's politics. <laughs> um, but it's certainly, um, it, she's someone that I've taken a lot of strength from uh, in, my, in my time as, as being in, in federal parliament. Uh, it hasn't been all bad. Uh, it's actually been quite exciting because um, there's been this incredible diaspora that have wanted to meet me, uh, engage with me, uh, a lot more than coming from my very small state of Tasmania. So it has really opened up a number of new uh, friends, uh, connections, and uh, uh, ideas as, as part of uh, our democracy, being someone of, of my background. Okay. Yeah, the gentleman here in the entry. Kishore Dakke, Monash University. You correctly pointed out that there is a very small minority of people of Asian origin in the parliament. <coughs> However, perhaps you have to add in the dimension of time, because now we do not bat an eyelid when we see a Vietnamese mayor in the southeastern, the number of Greek and Italian origin uh, senators and members of parliament, etc., is just everyday occurrence now. So maybe we have to give it some time, a generation or two, before the true representation of the numbers in the society is represented in the parliaments. 
I th look, I think you, you raise a really good point, and I think you are right in that point. It does take time. I think that we can look back to the 1950s suite of migration post-war that came from Europe and those particular uh, diaspora throughout our, our society today or, or even, yeah, even in our parliament. What I'm concerned about, though, is if there is a blockage for people of Asian origin, of subcontinent uh, heritage, in our democracy. We know they do very well in the legal fraternity, in, in the medical fraternity, uh, and the like, business. Um, but when it comes to our democracy, uh, we are very light on the ground, <laughs> incredibly so. It may take time, it may be a generational thing, as you say. Uh, I just hope it's not something endemic of, of anything else like Tim Sapomasane was trying to highlight with uh, his bamboo, bamboo curtain um, uh, paper. You don't think the dollars are a matter, do you? What was that? Wait, I said you don't think the dollar has, a, has an influence on it. You said that they're doctors and lawyers. Uh, they're earning <coughs> ten times more. That's true. I'm in a much poorer profession. <laughs> Anthony? Yeah. Uh, Anthony DeCosta. Rory, why don't you come and sit here? Australia India Institute. Um, I have some difficulty with the notion of multiculturalism in the Indian context because it seems to me that multiculturalism as a way in a policy kind of context is always being used by countries that experience immigration. To give you a very good example, the United States has a very explicit and a very deliberate multicultural policy, but we also know that the US is very much an immigrant country. Um, increasingly, Asian countries including South Korea and Japan, because of the influx of workers and professionals, they are beginning to talk about multiculturalism. But I wonder, what do you think? I mean, how is India going to talk about multiculturalism in a society that has always been, I would say, multicultural? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess it, there's a conceptual, I think, issue here. And I think you highlight the differences between India and Australia on this matter, and, and other Western nations like, like the US. Australia really is a success story when it comes to multiculturalism. We have done it well and we've done it well at a public policy level. India, it's always been there. Uh, it, to have, having to define it now, which I think has happened in the last couple of decades, uh, may mean changes to some of its legal systems, its, um, you know, its, its public institutions, like we have um, you know, laws here in Australia. But it has always been there. But I think, really, it's about how you define multiculturalism. And for me, multiculturalism is about the right to difference. You know, that, that we are all different, but it's that unity in diversity, that we, we have the right to hold on to our culture, but be a part of a broader culture. Um, and I think in India, it's a melting pot of that, very much so. Australia, more, more so in a new way, um, but to me, that's really what, what it's about. I think in, in the US, it's, it's been a bit more divisive, uh, multiculturalism. It's, it's been very much um, a bit of a race divide based on their history. Um, here in Australia, we've had really strong public policies coming back from the Hawke-Keating years, earlier even at the end of the White Australia policy. Uh, we've, we've really, because of our history, wanted to ensure that it has worked and I think um, despite you know, what might be going on globally at the moment uh, with various upheavals that occur occasionally in our, in our suburbs in, in Australia, in the main, we, we've, we've got it pretty, pretty right. Yeah, a few gentlemen here, a gentleman there, then Pradeep, and then let's... Okay, three of you, but I think we'll have to just club questions, please. Okay, I, I just want to ask one question. That is, you know, you're talking about caste system in India, which is very much talked about overseas. We face it all the time. Now, as you mentioned, caste system is more socioeconomic than anything else. So they are the, well, economically and socially the downfall. Compared to that, do you put the aborigines in Australia the same as the lowest caste in, in, in India? I mean, that means Australia also got a caste system because Aborigines are the most disadvantaged people here. They are among socially and economically very much lowest. How do you comment on that? 
Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't compare it to the caste system. I think it, <laughs> the caste system in India is is, is a yeah, unique beast, isn't it? <laughs> but I think on the socio-economic front that you raise, that yeah. there, therein lies uh, a reality here in Australia. There is a definite inequality of uh, our indigenous people compared to the mainstream Australia, and there's no better um, example of that than in our prison system. Um, huge overrepresentation of Indigenous people within our prison system because of the other inequalities that have led to them being there. Um, so I'm, I'm not in any way by talking about caste uh, denying Australia's inequalities and Australia's uh, uh, issues of socio-economic uh, opportunities or, or, or not you know, lack of opportunities in that sense as well. But Lisa, I think just to follow up on that, now in this map of multiculturalism, people of, often do not include indigenous people because they have a special relationship yeah. mm -hmm. with the land and the country. Mm -hmm. Now, how does one actually address that issue? Mm. Look, I think that's really important. I think that we need to recognise when we do talk about multiculturalism, we are talking very much about uh, everyone who lives here. Uh, very much so, though, our indigenous population. I think a good example uh, of that, that unity between various multicultural groups, including indigenous Australians, uh, came recently with um, uh, the Attorney General's attempt to uh, repeal Section 18C from the Racial Discrimination Act. What came out of that were key peak uh, groups, peak community groups, multicultural groups, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups, all coming together as one. And so whilst we need to be careful in our discourse to ensure that we are including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, for me it's a given, but it's not always a given, I think that example showed that they felt very much like they were a part of this, uh, this racial discrimination issue and very much part of a multicultural country. Yeah. Just getting back to the point of, I guess, parliamentary representation and, I guess, the time that it takes, are you noticing people of South Asian and even Pan-Asian backgrounds being involved in the Labor Party now at the sort of the lower levels and, and yeah. you know, making yeah. their way up through the party? Yes, indeed. I think when we talk about local government, I think someone talked about mm. mayors and so on, Local government and, and state parliaments, uh, there, therein lies a lot of change going on. Don't, I don't, still don't see it very much at the federal level. Um, uh, having said that, there are pre-selection processes on, on all, both parties, on all sides, when it Green comes to Green. federal parliament, which are competitive. The Greens ran a woman from a Sikh background in right. Batman last election. So right. there are, I guess... Changes. There are changes. Yeah. But yeah. you see, the local government is the nursery <laughs> of the federal government at yeah. the end of the day. That's where you yeah. learn your politics and you move on. Yeah. Well, it's the same for me. <laughs> Having done four years in state parliament really did ground me for federal parliament, uh, I have to say. But, um, uh, I, yeah, I, th I think there are definitely changes at those other levels of, of, of government, but not so much if, at federally at this point in time. The Labor Party, though, has adjuncts like it has the subcontinent Friends of Labor. Uh, there's about to be a launch of one here next Friday night, actually, in Melbourne. Uh, there isn't one here presently, but there is, is one in Sydney. I think there's looking at, to be one in Perth as well. Uh, Binod? Uh, yeah, I'm Binod Kadria from Jawaharlal University, visiting the Asia Institute at this university. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for very, you know, informative and hilarious uh, talk on the multiculturalism. When I, it makes me think about Indian multiculturalism. I think you also refer to the Indian constitution. Uh, I would like to think that in India we do have internal multiculturalism, but when it comes to external multiculturalism, then I think of people from other countries in India, how <coughs> they are integrated, whether there is a scope or space for them. Our neighbors like Bangladeshis or Nepalis or even from distant land in Africa, Nigeria, and so on, how whether do are we anywhere near Australia in that sense? That's a good question, and you can probably answer it better than I can, <laughs> coming from India. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that 
obviously language in the subcontinent flows over into India, B Bengali, for example. But um, it's yeah, it's a. Then again, in the parliament, in the in the Indian parliament, there are two seats I think reserved for Anglo Indians. Yes. yes. Yeah. So. There are some structures that are allowing <laughs> some of it. different entity. Bangladeshis and Nepalis and, you know, these are different nationalities. They are different, right. yes. But it's always a challenge. Yeah. But the one thing which, at least in my understanding, is the major difference between Canadian multiculturalism and Australian multiculturalism is that there's no legislative framework uh, for multiculturalism. It's through practice rather than through legislation that multiculturalism has been institutionalized. Mm. That's very true. I mean, it's, 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 it's really a public policy. Yeah. Um, it's not in our constitution. I mean, our constitution really is out of date for such a modern multicultural country. Um, but we have therefore made amends by creating institutions like the Anti-Discrimination Commissions, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, it's not as good as having a binding document or a charter of rights or whatever you want to call it, uh, like India's 1950 constitution is, uh, I think. And similarly, if you look at South Africa's uh, constitution as well, some really defining values that really map out what that country, country is and you know, stands for. Uh, we are lacking that, I think, yeah. here. But just one follow-up question, is it, uh I mean, there was a debate in the 70s and 80s. Is, does this celebration of multiculturalism mean that you forget or somehow banish the history of a non-multicultural uh, period? Robert, you could probably answer that better. Because there was a historical debate between Blaney, I think it was, who led that debate about how those years, the white Australia years, shouldn't be seen as uh, the years of wrongdoing. Mm. Look, I think, I think we need to take history in, in all its faults and <laughs> foibles. And the thing about uh, the time of the white Australia policy or, and you know, living in it or through those decades was that we actually did have a slight element of multiculturalism still then. I mean, even in Tasmania, we, we celebrate the, um, the Chinese tin miners who, who came and really built this community in the north east of Tasmania. Uh, we've got a Chinese artist that's kind of created the whole story uh, to do with that time. Um, you know, we can find these little kind of pockets of, of uh, different cultures sharing uh, and contributing in a white Australia policy time. Um, but for me, I guess, as a, someone of second generation uh, Indian origin here living in Australia, it's, um, it's about contemporary Australia. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's about today and where we want to see ourselves into the future, where I want to see my children living in this country, what it's going to be like, what it's going to be like for them after we're gone. <laughs> Pradeep the, and the gentleman in the last seat and then you Liz. Pradeep Kanega from Political Science here. Senator, first to fact check, the four politicians in the federal parliament, are they all in the Senate? Do we have any in the lower house? One in the lower house. One in the lower house. Okay, so three in the Senate. Uh, secondly, the question is, you, as you said, there's about 400,000 plus you know, people of Indian origin in Australia. And among them, there are some very good communicators, and there are some ambitious politicians, or future politicians, and they would like to be, obviously, not just in the local councils, they would like to be in, in the federal parliament, in the state parliament. Now, the question is, with ethnic identity, and clearly for somebody from South Asia, for example, or from China, your ethnic identity is part of who you are in the sense, physically. I mean, you are a visible migrant, and therefore when you go knock door to door, you know, clearly your appearance, your name, etc., is something that people pay attention to. So in countries like Fiji, for example, or Malaysia, where you do have a significant proportion of the population belonging to a particular ethnic group, Assertion of your ethnic identity can be helpful because you have a, a sizable you know, proportion of the population. If you can get majority of their vote, you can win elections. But in a country like Australia, for an Asian migrant who wishes to be in, in the parliament, does it help to assert your identity 
or actually you have to kind of hide your identity by adopting an anglicized name or something like that to, to be able to succeed in politics? That's a very interesting question. And I mean, I, I, th I think the former, I think that you do assert your, your identity and certainly not something you should hide. Uh, but clearly there are going to be pockets, suburbs, where that identity goes down very easily uh, with people that are of similar identity that, than in other areas where you know, English is the first and only language in the household, where they're not used to different pronunciations of surnames and the like, um, and where the, perhaps you know, for some, especially coming from an island state, they've had a fairly uh, sheltered life and uh, are not so familiar with uh, you know, the various cultures and, and people that make up Australia. So I think it can work both ways. It can work to your advantage, it can work to your disadvantage. But that's like everything in politics. That's like what you stand for. You know, I might stand for you know, the, the Cambodia deal for sending asylum seekers to be you know, rubbish. Uh, but I might knock on another, uh, another door and they might think that's a really good... So you're never going to please everybody. But as you say, your identity is who you are and no matter what you look like, uh, ethnicity, gender, sex, you should get out there and sell yourself and be proud of who you are based on what you believe in rather than anything else. Yeah. Hi, uh, Senator. Uh, my name is Angus Blackburn. I'm doing the Masters in International Relations program here at Melbourne. Um, I'm interested in the uh, relationship between India and Australia, and particularly, I suppose, the construction of the relationship between India and Australia, both from an Indian and Australian perspective. Given that India, I suppose, has been left out of the discussion about, about Australia's uh, move to Asia or within Asia, um, depending on how you feel about that, uh, and you talk about the relationship being a work in progress, um, what do you think the potential for the Indian-Australian relationship is? How, how far do you think, uh, how strong can the ties become? Uh, and can it be as strong as the ties between, say, Australia and China, or Australia and other East Asian states, or even Australia and the US, Australia and Europe? Thank you, Angus. Look, I think they can be even stronger. I think that the Australia-China relationship is, you know, has been uh, worked on now for some time. I think the Australia-India relationship, as I said, is still a work in progress. I think it's still got a lot of growth uh, to be achieved within it. Uh, but there are so many similarities, uh, if I can leave Indira Gandhi's comment to one side, there are so many similarities between Australia and India as very, you know, as vibrant democracies to start with. I'm not going to get into the cricket stereotyping, but that, that, that we can understand each other at, at, I think, a very um, yeah, soft diplomacy level uh, very well. And beyond the trade relationships, beyond, obviously, uh, uh, selling our uranium to India, uh, although my, my former ministerial colleague, Martin Ferguson, would, would highlight very much that that is very much linked to socio-economic prosperity for India, um, I think we can, we can do so much more, and education is a key part of that. The Australia Awards, uh, in, in you going to India as much as Indian students coming here has got to be part of that makeup. Yeah, thanks. Liz Oli, um, uh, thanks very much for your address. I know you haven't touched on this, but I'm just interested to ask, given the high rate of unemployment in Tasmania, whether the federal Labor government has strategies and plans to address the issue? Uh, that would be a question for the yeah. federal government. Yes. <laughs> no, no, Not no, for no, me. For when I'm looking to the future. Oh, when sorry. To, oh, yeah. for when we yeah. are re-elected. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 It's a very optimistic That's question. I mean. <laughs> um, uh, definitely. We took a jobs plan to the last election. Obviously, the Federal Labor wasn't elected, though. Um, but we would definitely have a jobs plan and, and future plans for Tasmania into the future. Tasmania, like so much of Australia, though, has very much got a strong tourism industry. And if you talk about people-to-people -people relationships that will continue to grow with India, it's, it's rising middle class and then wanting to come and visit 
our beautiful country. As much as we go over there and continue to go over there and do the same, going to various um, temples and gurdwaras and uh, you know beautiful forts and Rajasthan or the like, uh, we will continue, I think, to see a flow of, uh, uh, of Indian uh, middle class tourists uh, to Australia and I very much would be encouraging to, them to come to Tasmania. Thank you. Our anthropologist friend. Uh, yeah, Hans Baer, an anthropologist in development studies. Uh, you mentioned Penny Wong as being a mentor and a kind of a role model. And uh, Christine Mill uh, is from your uh, state, the, the leader of the Greens uh, at the present time. Uh, is she in some way uh, a role model uh, for you, or is, would that be disloyal? having a, a, a role model from a, a, from a different party and, and maybe you could talk about how the two of you hit it off. <laughs> Thank you. Christine, uh, Christine is a parliamentary colleague. She comes from my home state. I've known her for many, many years. But I guess I don't work as intimately with Christine as I do with Penny. Because we are in the same party, um, it, is, it is with Penny that, that, and you know, on the same side of the Senate, um, that I have developed that bond and respect and mentorship. Uh, I don't think if I asked that of Christine, she would perhaps offer it up coming from a different party. Having said that though, I do spend time with Christine, most, more often than not on the aeroplane, because we're often on the same flight. Uh, or uh, Christine and I move motions in, in the parliament together, because they are things that are in the interests of, of Tasmania across both parties. Or they are issues, uh, global issues, that we're interested in, like uh, the issues with HIV and AIDS. Um, so we still collaborate. We still do things together. I, I would regard her as, as a good colleague, uh, just not so much a mentor. Yeah, OK. Uh, you know, we're going to now run out of time. So I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to give 30 seconds each to the last three people who want to ask the question. One quick question. Where do you stand on bottle deposits? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I understand. Uh, container deposits, yeah. yeah. Um, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Gentleman there. Yeah, Pat, just a quick question. A few years ago, Australia, I believe, had a bad reputation in India because of the number of attacks on Indian students here, and robberies and violent attacks and so forth. And I think in the media, you know, they were saying to parents, don't send your children to Australia, it's far too dangerous a country. How's our reputation now? I think it's much, much better. I think we've moved on, yeah. you know, enormously since 2009 and, and, and what occurred at that time. And having just come back from India a couple of weeks ago, having some of those conversations, I think I'm, I'm right in saying so. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Amalina, and I've been working with the, I'm a member of an organisation called the Asian Australian Lawyers Association, and we're trying to promote uh, the Asians amongst the um, legal, uh, in the high echelons of the legal profession, and it's, <laughs> I, I don't agree with your um, observation that the uh, lawyers, there's a lot of representation of Asians, maybe second generation, but definitely not first generation. And, um, you know, but um, I agree with your, your other observation. My question is whether, do you think there's a lot of initiative, policy initiative from the government side, uh, from councils and everywhere, do you think we require a legislative change to actually make it really multicultural in the sense of giving jobs uh, and equal representation for um, Asians or, or people from other backgrounds in society other than just giving them, having multicultural shows and having Diwali celebrations or Chinese New Year and things like that. Okay, thank you. I, my sister's a lawyer, uh, so maybe I was generalising her with the India. <laughs> but I think, I think Melina misunderstood what Lisa had said. She didn't say that lawyers were represented in associations, but that there were lawyers and doctors and professionals who were doing very well. Yeah, professionals. Yes, they're definitely yeah. doing well. It's just that a lot of them are not represented in the higher echelons of, uh, of that community. I haven't yes, seen it. still pushing for that. So yeah. I know I think it came from one of our talks as well. There is commissioner and he said as well that there isn't enough representation. So I think what you're alluding to is the quota system in our it's parliament or, or thereabouts. I mean, my views, I, I've got mixed views on, on quotas and I think uh, if we're going to look at any cha legislative change uh, to have a quota system in our federal parliament, 
at the moment it would be to start with Indigenous representation uh, uh, at this stage. But uh, we need to look at other ways, I think, at this point in time to increase our uh, ethnic makeup of our parliament. I think it's a matter of natural progression. If you look at the US example where, you know, the professional migration took place starting about 40 years ago, and today we have governors of Indian descent in various states and moving into the Congress and so on. It took 40 years. I think we are 15 years to 20 years away <laughs> from this happening uh, in, a, in a successful manner because the generations coming to the Australian universities of people of Indian descent, they are, uh, for all practical purposes, like Australians, and nothing will stop them. And I think it's, it's a matter of time. We should not get impatient, but I think we should sustain what we're doing. Let me now just ask our chair to give a formal word of thanks and to give you a little present as a token of our gratitude and make his concluding remarks. So, uh, thank you very much, Senator Singh, for your uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion of multiculturalism uh, in India and in Australia and what we can each learn from the other. Um, uh, they are big questions about, um, as we think about the construction of the society that we all want to have. And for my part, I was raised in country Victoria. Uh, in the 1950s, and the change uh, in know, in Bendigo, the change in Bendigo has been at least as, as has been a phenomenally dramatic change as it has been for most of Australia, um, and it was largely because people decided that we should change, um, just as in the 1890s, uh, which. In effect, we decided to change as a result of constructing Australia. Uh, the first, the first act of the Austra of the new Australian Parliament was the White Australia Act. We shouldn't forget these uh, important points in our history, um, and I think we sh we ought to be as reluctant to try and capture forever a view of the future of Australia now as we would now regret they did in 1890. And I think, uh, so my, my life is mostly spent in business um, and the debate in business about the role of difference in enterprise um, has been one that's been a very lively one. Uh, the most popular manifestation of that has been women on boards um, or women as chief executives. Uh, but I think my concern is if we, if we get too worried about defining the, the issue at the point in time, we will lose the ability to continue to change. So why do I think why am I pleased that the board on which I serve has and has had for many years a very strong number of women? It is, I think, that we are a better business. The decision-making that goes on is, as a result of the diversity, more robust and more resilient and encompasses a broader a range of opinions and as a result, we get better decisions. So I think what we need to do is to think about what we're trying to achieve. You know, what's, what is the purpose of doing these things rather than trying to capture at any point in time? Uh, I mean, the, the story about the reservation of two seats for Anglo-Indians is, is quaint, <laughs> maybe irrelevant, but it's, uh, but you know, in some, in some ways it's an odd, it's an odd historical quirk rather than a very useful device to the construction of a more uh, interesting, powerful, open, uh, affluent India for the next generation. So I think that's, that's the way we want to think about these things. Um, but your talk you know, raises all these sort of issues, these lovely issues. Um, and, I, and 
one of the great pleasures for me in being able to have my involvement with the Australia India Institute is that for me it's opened up a whole different world of opportunity, possibility and diversity. Uh, and I think the sorts of things you raised are just the issues we have to continue to raise as we think about you know, what is the nature of the society we want to have in the future and what are the nature of the relationships that we want to have uh, with other countries from which we can learn so much as we can with India. Um, I um, am old enough or young enough to think uh, to remember, I think, the first visit of an Australian cricket team to Australia. Uh, well, we think cricket is one of the great enduring connections that we've had with India, and yet we've been playing cricket with India for a very short time. Um, I can remember when Pataudi came and on one leg, with one eye, made his heroic at the MCG? At the MCG. I can't remember the number of runs, which I should be able to. Um, so thank you very much, Lisa. I'm sorry, I've rambled on. But you, <laughs> you've uh, you've sort of encouraged me to think about these sorts of things. So thank you very thank much. You.